quick brown fox jump over the lazy dog. It's where we all begin. Welcome to Lazy Dog Typewriters. In the 1970s show, Connections, James Burke explored the hidden historical links between technology. How one small thing can lead to another, ultimately making a connection. We're here to make a connection ourselves, a connection between a wide range of ultra-portable typewriters, all linked by a single manufacturer, Silver Seiko. Howdy folks, and welcome to Lazy Dog Typewriters. We talked about connections in my introduction, and now let's see the connection with these beautiful typewriters. All right, well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. And what we see before you now are four, one, two, Voila. three, and four gorgeous typewriters. Three of the four have been custom painted, and those are the Silver Reed in red, the Royal Mercury in pink and uh, gray, and the Underwood 255, also in red. And we have a Royal Sprite in its original color combination of red, white, and blue. You might think green and yellow, but I think it predates the drink, and it's and referring more to the fairy than it is to the fountain drink. So. What is the connection between all of these machines? Well, multiple connections, I suppose, but all of them were made by Silver Seiko. The machines you see assembled here in front of you uh, represent a time period from about 1969, not about, but from 1969 uh, with the Silver Reed, also coincidentally 1969 with this Mercury, um, about 1972, I believe, on the Sprite, all the way up to about 1977 with the Underwood 255. So what was going on in the typewriter world at this time was a boom time, of course, in the late 60s. But it was a boom time where the demise of the typewriter industry was looming on the horizon. And every manufacturer was trying to figure out how to defend their own market share by reducing costs. And to that end, the established players like Royal and Underwood, which of course had been wrapped up in its merger with Olivetti, uh, Underwood Olivetti, and then Triumph Adler, this massive consolidation which took place and bankruptcies in Europe, uh, was totally fixated on reducing cost. So at about this time, they started shipping typewriter production to Holland, which of course at that time was a cheap place for production. Now we call it the Netherlands and nothing is cheap there. And they also began shipping manufacturing over to Japan. Part of this was in response to the epic success of the Brother typewriter company, which was cranking out lots and lots of JP1 machines, against which these particular machines were intended to directly compete. So. Without further ado, we're going to zoom in on each of these machines and talk about some of the pros and cons of the Silver Seiko uh, model. And I don't even know if it has a specific model name, uh, partly because it was made under so many other model names. We'll go over some of the common features of this machine and then give you a comparison with some of its competitors, particularly the Brother JP-1. Stand by. Should we take the red pill or the pink pill? We say the pink pill. Underwoods, we do not discriminate against you. All right, so what we have here is a Royal Mercury. And we, you, you will never see, well, you may, ne you may see another one quite like this, but this is one that we have custom created. Our good friend Typewriter Minutes has done a wonderful video on the Royal Mercury, and we could never hope to match what he has done, but I don't know if he can match our pink paint job. <laughs> so... He called the Royal Mercury the Mr. Cellophane of typewriters. And uh, if you've never heard of that reference, it's, I believe, a reference from the movie musical Chicago. So the main features of the Royal Mercury are its ultra-portable uh, layout. This particular model uh, was fully equipped. As you can see here, it came with a dedicated... Number one... Exclamation key. point. And, and then also... A plus an E equals key. And these, here is your ribbon color selector, which lets you select between the top and the lower portion of the ribbon. 
uh, out of order there. We have a touch control selector here, high and low tension. This regulates a spring, which uh, adjusts how the keys feel when you're typing on them. This has a standard QWERTY keyboard layout. You've got your caps lock key over here. Your margin release in this instance is over here on the left. And the margin release is a kind of a key that sometimes migrates around. Sometimes it's on the right, sometimes it's on the left. But in this particular layout, it is over here on the left. Your controls, well, we have your carriage return arm here. You have your line selector here. Now, interestingly enough, and we'll come in and zoom in on that if you can see it, is you have uh, a number of different positions, okay? So you've got, without my reading glasses, I'll have to go by faith, but you've got one, two, and, th uh, sorry, zero, two, a dot, a line, a one, and then, interestingly enough, if we can get it, you have a red dot. Okay, this is a hallmark of some of the Japanese machines. Nakajima did it, but also Silver Saker, Seiko did it. And what that is, is that's the position you put your machine in to lock the carriage. And this can lead to a lot of frustration uh, if you put it in that red dot position and you're like, hey, my carriage will not move. It's, it's because you've locked it. And that can be a little confusing. But it's interesting, you have one, one and a half, and two, and then zero, which is freewheeling, which is hard to do one-handed, but freewheeling of your platen. So let's zoom back out. You have also, I want to point out, your margin slider. So you press and slide your margin. That's not so novel, but the margin sliders on the Silver Seiko are concave, right? Or they curve down and then up. I think of them as like little pagoda wings because they are coming from Japan. But that's important to note because that is one of the easiest ways to distinguish a Silver Seiko machine from a Nakajima machine. A Nakajima-made machine, contemporaneously made, uh, has a convex ribbons or margin slider, so it curves up. It's peaked in the center. I think these are a little bit more effective. It's easier to get your finger in there, but uh, that's the one thing to look out for. Okay, so you've got a ruler. This one goes over to 80, which tells us it's going to be a pica typeface, 10 character per inch. You have a paper support, which you just very simply lift up. I think this is an improvement over the brother models because they don't have a spring to press, which almost always uh, at this stage in its life gets bent out of position. You can't move your paper support easily. So it's just real simple. You just press it and it spins up. We've got our panel plate here for your serial number. On the right hand side, we have our paper tension lever, which will put tension on your rollers. And then you have your carriage release lever, just a single one. Let's see if we can hear the bell. All right, a nice little bell. Very simple, stamped aluminum, a single spring, very obvious to see it. Interesting construction, you have your carriage rails here, and the carriages, instead of being flat as it is in a great many machines, the Silver Seiko model has it at an angle, and you have what I can only assume is a cost-cutting measure of having a screw projecting straight up and down through your carriage rails, and that serves as a blocker uh, to prevent any bearings or your star wheels from coming out. So overall, everything goes on cost and simplifying things. Just for future reference, if you want to adjust the height of the capital, uh, the relative height of the lowercase and uppercase characters, these set screws here are how you do it. And let's take a look under the hood as we keep going. Okay, we have, of course, our Mercury name badge here, and that is the original paint. Our ribbon cover comes off. It's just like the brother, I mean, identical to the brother. Maybe these fins here. These fins here are a little bit sharper, I would say. Maybe. But you have these tabs, which we have replaced uh, with padding tubing. We have these little uh, uh, bayonet plug type things. And we have a very similar uh, rubber gasket down here to secure the ribbon cover in place. We have our segment here. The layout of the type bars is different in this machine from the Brother. That is one major difference. Um, I don't know what you call this type of layout, dowel and rod, there's terms that are uh, escaping me at the moment, but it's oriented in a different uh, orientation, <clears throat> this rack, uh, than the uh, Brother machines. <clears throat> the ribbon advance system is, uh, is nice. Some of the later Brothers around the mid-70s, the Charger 11s, have gone to a simple, this little pusher pawl here has been replaced with a really thin metal one in the Brothers. I know I'm just compar comparing it ahead of time to the brothers. I thought you were going to say Pusher Steve or something. Yes, not Pusher Paul, Peter, or Mary, but Pusher Paul. Um, in any case, so they've got lightweight uh, metal segment, uh, a nice solid frame on the inside, and we've got metal, um, metal components all around. So just a very svelte, very sleek machine. You can tell from looking at it that 
You know, the, the Groma Calibri and others are a little bit flatter and less angular than these machines, but these are really are nice ultra portable machines. Uh, if I had to guess off the top of my head, they're coming in around nine pounds, between nine and 10, which uh, for its era was a really good, good weight. And like I said, the only, only flaw on these right off the bat was um, they're rather bland, right? They're, the color combo was kind of bland, but we hopefully have spiced that up and Valentine's Day is coming up, so we think pink might be the way to go. You look at the name badge, Royal, what's this LI? That is Litton Industries. That's another reflection of the massive consolidation that was going on mm -hmm. in the typewriter industry uh, at that time. So Litton Industries owned Royal and Underwood and a lot of other different brands. So we'll take a pause and we'll take a look at its brothers, if you will, uh, other Silver Seiko manufactured machines that bear different name brands. Okay, so now what you see in front of you is a custom painted Underwood 255, 255. Major differentiating characteristics of this machine, it has the same uh, controls and layout, but it does have a slightly different keyboard. This machine does not have a dedicated number one. Um, it does not also have a touch control on the left, but it still retains the ribbon color selector. That's good. That is good. It's always nice to be able to change your ribbon color. Um, but all the other controls are the same, flatten knob, paper veil, and uh, the same characteristic concave uh, ribbon sliders. We have a Made in Japan label in the back. And of course, all the parts are interchangeable on these two machines if you were to convert them. The same kind of, same exact ribbon cover and bayonets. We were able to retain the original uh, rubber pieces for this one because it was in such good shape. And this is partly because it was one of the newer models. We think this one is about 1977. There's only one other Underwood 255 on the typewriter database. Um, so our numbers are somewhat limited to know from. This is in the 50 million range. Whoa. It starts out in 1976, so I just guessed 1977. But it's newer, so that means that the rubber components are sometimes in better shape. And we have been able to retain these rubber feet because uh, they're still soft and squishy, which is always nice. The screws that go in through here are slightly different than the brother ones. They're not cross-compatible, of course. Uh, and they have a pointed tip, which is kind of interesting, kind of a spear point. All right. Mm -hmm. Now we have a Royal Sprite, also with the Litton Industries label. This is a different machine because instead of having a metal metal uh, panels, it has uh, plastic body panels, and of course a few other cosmetic differences like the red platinum. So what do you think about that, Kevin? It's patriotic. It's a very patriotic Sprite. Yes, exactly. Not just Coca-Cola is patriotic nowadays, but Sprite too. So let's go over its features. It, like its brother, the Royal Mercury, has its uh, dedicated, full dedicated key, uh, dedicated one full keyboard. This one also has the added advantage of having a tab. Tab. Yeah, and so margin release still remains on the left. Backspace, we still have our fraction characters, uh, etc. We have the same carriage return, although the lever actually seems to be a little bit different. And no, I think it's exactly the same. And we have the same um, line selector, zero to one and a half, one, and then red dot to lock. Again, this goes up to 80 on 85 on, on the uh, ruler. Um, so we know that it's a pica machine. And the ribbon cover comes off a little bit difficulty. There we go. It has a little slightly different bayonet plug, Ooh. and it has a the same exact metal frame on the inside, which just fits snugly into this plastic frame. These two front pieces are kind of neat because they come out independently. There's a screw here uh, and a screw over here. You remove those and then you can re remove these front pieces and then you remove the four screws that hold the feet in and you can remove the typewriter from its plastic case for any maintenance you need to do. So also like the Royal Mercury, this is a fully featured typewriter. In. Fully featured typewriter because we have a touch control which is very uh, very robust and then we have our line color selector over here. We have the same push to rise paper support and of course our classic silver Seiko concave concave um, origin sliders. And last but not least, we have the Silver Reed. This is a Silver Reed 7200. And I'm not entirely sure why Silver Seiko chose to go with the name Silver Reed for its own brand. Um, 
I don't know. Uh, if someone knows, I'd love to hear it. Maybe it has more of a British twang to it. I'm not certain. But we decided to change this silver machine, which actually was kind of a little, very slight bluish hint tone, uh, to another beautiful bright red. Uh, we are getting ready for Valentine's Day, and that's why we have this wonderful card with our heart ready to go for you. Katie, why don't you just see that? So ready for your Valentine's. But just continuing the overview of this machine, like the Royal Mercury, which this machine really is exactly the same as the Royal Mercury. It is a Royal Mercury. I can prove it. You can look over here and see it sitting right next to it. Except it doesn't have uh, this uh, this piece on the front, the name badge, so it's going to be a little bit formed differently, but it's exactly the same angles and uh, pieces on this machine, on this silver reed machine. Okay, so we have our touch control over here on the left. We have our ribbon color selector. We have a full keyboard with a dedicated one. Um, I guess one slight difference is the keyboard has, instead of a margin release MR or MARREL spelled out, you have a double arrow and you have a down arrow for your shift lock. And the backspace is also symbolic or iconic, if you will, with uh, an arrow versus, I guess, the more American styled or traditional uh, writing it out. Maybe this slightly uh, reflects a little bit more of an international focus. I don't know. We have retrobodied these keys, but these keys, they kind of look a little bit more like teeth to me than almost anything because they have a shiny dentin, if you will, uh, coating. And so we are not always successful in getting these. These particular silver reed uh, chemical uh, composition of these keys is such that there's always going to be just a hair of uh, uh, fading on some of these. We have a difficult time getting out, but I think you have to look really hard to notice that it is there. All right. Um... <coughs> We think all of these are beautiful, so it's hard to say. Kevin, which one of these you think is the best looking one? And we'll do our typing test on that machine. Um, you know what? Since we don't really feature that many Underwoods, let's do the Underwood 255. All right, Kevin likes the youngest machine. So we'll do the Underwood 255, get set up, and give you guys an overview of the typing touch of the Silver Seiko branded machines. Okay, so... We're loading up paper. It's a little bit wrinkled, but what I wanted you to see was we're loading up two sheets of paper. And this is one thing which is kind of the only shortcoming, or not shortcoming, but just fact of life with these Silver Seiko machines. Unlike their competitors, the Brother, these Silver Seiko platens are hard. Mm -hmm. Brothers maintains a soft platen. There's something different about the, chem uh, the chemical composition of their rubber. Uh, which is miraculous and gives them an advantage for sure over many other machines. But anyway, well, there we go. That's a classic example of having it in the red dot. So you're like, oh, my carriage is broken. No, let's shift it into one and a half spaces. Go over and do our typing test. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. That's where it all begins, which will happen soon. Begin. All right, so I always wish I could have you here to experience these machines for yourself, but the defining characteristic of these Silver Seikos for me are two. One, the hard platen, I guess three. Two, the typing action is very snappy. It is just really enjoyable. Um, it's, I don't know if it's amplified because the platen's hard and you can kind of hear the thwack and maybe feel the thwack a little bit more than you can with a brother machine. But the keystrokes, the key typing touch is decidedly snappier on these um, Silver Seiko machines than it is on the Brother. The Brother is very comfortable. It's almost kind of like an Olympia versus an Adler. I don't know. Uh, There's another thing you could think of it. And the Olympia with a softer touch would be the Brother, and the Adler with a little bit more crisp touch would be the Silver Seiko. So use that in your, uh, in your reference points. I really like this, uh, this typing action. The other thing that to notice, though, is I find that this, this bank of keys, if you look at it, it's kind of distinctive. The bottom three banks are, you know, very traditional in their layout, but the top bank, for some reason, is just a little bit of a broader gap between the top third row, or the top row here, second row, and the, the actual top row. Maybe they just don't like each other. <laughs> Maybe they don't want to stay away from each other. But... Um, it doesn't cause anything, it doesn't impact you really, it's just something to kind of notice. I'm not sure why they did that, it's, it's kind of interesting and distinctive that you have this little bit, almost, the angle it changes a little bit. You have this level and then you have a little more of a, an incline uh, when you're using these machines. So that's just something distinctive. All right, let's go ahead and talk about the pros and cons and we'll just uh, go ahead and go over them uh, verbally. Um, pros, these are wonderful lightweight typers. 
that have a great typing action. Um, they are all metal construction with the exception of the Sprite, which is nice solid uh, plastic, but uh, they're directly analogous to the JP1 variants, and they are, I mean, there was some probably some patent infringement or something going on, um, at least in the overall design, but they do have a different segment, and they have a different uh, comb and how these, the keys are laid out, uh, so that is uh, distinctive. Um, they are just uh, wonderful machines, um, and uh, they come in such a wide variety of makes and um, shapes and sizes, I guess, and now ours come in a wide variety of colors because we have taken one of the only cons, if you will. The one con is the platens are hard. The other con is they're kind of the Mr. Vanilla or Mr. Cellophane, to quote our friend Typewriter Minutes, of typewriters because they look kind of, you know, kind of tame if you don't uh, dress them up. So that's one of the reasons we decided to dress ours up. And the other reason is Valentine's Day is coming down the corner, and so uh, they might make a nice Valentine's Day gift. So we hope you've enjoyed this little lesson on connections. Um, and uh, hope you have a wonderful Valentine's Day. Oh, and Katie wants to tell us something as well. Happy Valentine's Day and happy 100th day of school. Awesome. And as we have been talking about connections with these connections between Royal and Underwood and uh, Silver Seiko and Silver Reed, Kevin wants to talk to us about another connection. What connection do you want to talk about, Kevin? Um, I want to talk about the connection between the between a T-Rex and a chicken. You see, they walk very, very similar, and T-Rexes pretty much don't have any arms, so and chickens don't have any arms. And their fake structure, if you can believe it, is actually pretty similar. All right, it's hard to believe. Here we are typing on these dinosaurs of typing machines. Don't be chicken to try them out. Happy New Year's! Please like and subscribe and share the video and comment about the typewriter. What a specific thing that you want to know about the typewriter. And also hit the bell button and the subscribe.